The United Nations Human Rights Council has agreed to put alleged human rights abuses in Belarus under the microscope. The body passed a resolution today to place more scrutiny on authorities acting under President Alexander Lukashenko to quell the protest movement. Belarus has seen six weeks of protests since Lukashenko claimed victory in a disputed election on the 9th of August. The president's opponents say the vote was rigged and his police have cracked down on demonstrators calling for another election. Many opposition leaders have been detained or forced to flee the country, including the main challenger in last month's vote, Svetlana Tikhanovskaya. In a recorded message played at the UN meeting today, she slammed Lukashenko's response to the crisis. The situation in Belarus demands immediate international attention. Peaceful protesters are being illegally detained, beaten and raped. Some of the protesters have been found dead. We deny the unfounded accusations of uh, sexual violence against protesters. There is no official record of this. There is no confirmation also of claims that people have disappeared. Some people have been taken into custody in compliance with the legal and procedural code. That was Belarus's UN representative at the meeting today denying that any human rights violations have been taking place in Belarus. Those calls were backed by other nations, including China and Russia, who attempted to water down today's resolution. President Lukashenko has placed his army on high alert, meanwhile, and promised to close Belarus's border with two EU member states, Lithuania and Poland. However, Lithuanian and Polish officials have confirmed that the frontiers remain open for now. A little while ago, I caught up with Lithuania's foreign minister, Linus Linkovicius, about the possibility of a border closure. He cast doubt on whether the Belarusian president will actually deliver on his promise to shut down the frontiers. Anything what was stated by this outgoing leader is, uh, should be verified. And definitely, unfortunately, he's desperate and his statements are desperate. So this is really dangerous. And... Uh, many aspects uh, saying that uh, whatever he is doing, he should be very careful because the status of Belarusian economy is very weak, as we all know, to say the least. And uh, if he will do anything, what he threatens, it could be backlash, backlash so to see, to Belarus itself. And uh, that was the same with regard to the regarding of goods from the seaports to Russian ports. Then there were corrections, if we remember, that if Russia will provide uh, the same compatible conditions. Now, there's another statement. It's not just with regard to the uh, closing of border, but what is also disturbing us that this uh, half of the army will be sent to the western border to defend Belarus, knowing that nobody threatens Belarus. So it's really creating confusion, more tension, and it's very counterproductive. Now, you and your neighbours, including Latvia and Estonia, have already passed sanctions on officials within Belarus. What do you make of the EU's response so far? We're always saying that, <clears throat> with all understanding, that takes time, you know, adjustments and procedures, but uh, much time left, you know, m much time passed after these so-called elections, and we really have to react in a bit more tangible way, and I believe it will happen. It will happen because we're discussing these issues, we are preparing uh, some, some, so to say, well, concrete decisions. Um, after our, my meetings in D.C., I can say um, really good news that this is also in coordination with the United States, other stakeholders, uh, so that's something should happen. Definitely would like to do that more speedily. It's, it's not, not a secret. And sometimes we're reacting, uh, unfortunately, too late, sometimes too little, little, it's becoming the habit. But it doesn't mean that we shouldn't uh, seek for faster, faster uh, actions. And uh, I, I hope, I hope we will be able, after meeting in Brussels very soon, we'll be able, we'll be able to come up with more concrete kind of decision. Now, there's been a big debate in the European Parliament about whether Mr. Lukashenko should be included on that sanctions list. Members of European Parliament certainly think so. Do you, are you going to push the EU to include Lukashenko on the sanctions list? No, we're insisting to do that for, since very beginning. And I actually have no, no, do not understand reasoning why not to do that, because uh, previously we were issuing sanctions and there were more, uh, up to 150 people uh, on the list, and including Lukashenko, it was not a problem with regard to channels of communication. Uh, they must be kept accountable, basically. And uh, when it, we're talking about this outgoing leader, it's important uh, to say clearly that he's really outgoing. 
that his mandate morally, politically expired, and so, soon legally. So he cannot act on behalf of his own people, speak about, on behalf of them, or, or decide something, or sign something on behalf of them. It, it should be very clearly said by international community, by European Union, by others. And this is a matter of principle. So uh, I believe there is no reason to exclude him from the list, because he is the major uh, figure who is responsible for what happened. What do you make of the opposition in Belarus? And do they stand any real chance, considering the fact of how fractured they are at the moment? Tikhanovska is in your country, and there is no real organizational structure to the opposition council. Yes, this is true. This is, on one hand, really quite messy with regard to the uh, attitude and position of uh, this de facto leadership, because they, are, they have no clue to whom they should fight, now trying to hunt uh, these uh, members of Presidium of Coordination Council, one by, half, by one, just one person still is free, and uh, Nobel Prize winner Alexievich, but she's also intimidated, and they believe they will solve the issue like that. But it's not uh, maybe the case, because these people on the streets, they have organized, it's no connection, no connection of this Coordination Council, and this is, this is the, the truth, the reality also, we have to understand. So, well, situation is as, as it is. Well, let's get more on the future of Belarus's opposition now with one of the members from that Coordination Council, Max Bogretsov. Max, thanks very much for joining us here on your news tonight. As we just heard there from the Lithuanian Foreign Minister, he's sort of conceding that the Opposition Council doesn't really have any direction to go into the future. The organisational structure isn't really existent as what we see in normal political parties. What is your future from here? Uh, Oliver, I, I do agree with uh, our Lithuanian colleague uh, that decentralization is actually our strength, it's not our weakness when it comes to movement and our fight with oppression. Now, uh, to have a positive agenda and obviously to uh, draw a path to a future, we will have to create a democratic political system uh, with organizations uh, that represent people of Belarus. Uh, with the working constitution, framework of law, and, and everything else. But at this point, when we actually are up against uh, violence and uh, very, very, very uh, strong 26-years-old uh, 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 repression machine, I think this centralization is the best uh, thing there is. You know, the, the Yellow Vest protest movement in France also thought that decentralization was the best for them. And in the end, it's now turned out into a weakened body. It hasn't got the same strength as what it once has. Is there not a risk here that by not having a coordinated structure, your message is going to get diluted and people won't know who to turn to as to who's the actual opposition leader? <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, uh, I, you can have it both ways, right? Uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, to, to a certain degree, decentralization helps us uh, in a way that uh, you cannot just simply go after the head, you cannot simply go after leaders and actually quell the protests, right? At the same time, as time goes by, we are getting into economical and uh, social uh, disaster. We're getting closer and closer and closer. And this is really on authorities to realize that and to figure out that there is no any other way other than sit down at the table and figure out how we can get out of this crisis. We do believe that new forms of protest will appear. And the problem is for the authorities this time around is that people are very upset. And it's not just one or two leaders upset. It's actually all people of Belarus are upset with this level of violence that happened after the election and also level of cheating during the election. Now, just talking about funding there, during a previous meeting, the European Union said that it would be making funds available for civil society organizations inside Belarus. Have you been given any money from the EU so far? We would not take any money anyway. So there are a couple of things here. One is that uh, non-interference in our internal affairs is very important. I do agree with Vladimir Putin's statement uh, from Monday about that. It would be nice if that statement would actually be working and everybody would respect that. Now, uh, when it comes to humanitarian money and uh, crisis and help to uh, victims of the crime, uh, that actually is very difficult right now. And it's very difficult to operate any non-government organization or non-commercial organizations in Belarus. So right now, I think it's a moot point. 
Uh, in the future, yeah, we might we might need some help uh, specifically if we're going to have a difficult social situation. But right now, I don't think it's a, it's the right agenda, and I don't think uh, it's the right conversation. Now, given money on the one hand, but also stopping funds on the other, what do you make of the EU's lack of a response in terms of sanctions so far? Do you think they need to act quicker? Uh, so, to be honest with you, if history is any indication, uh, when a small country or a situation like that being caught in a very polarizing conversation between Russia on one side and EU or United States, the West on the other side, right? The efficiency of these actions are limited. So it's it's very good to hear from EU and uh, United Nations today support of people of Belarus and support of our fight for freedom. It's actually very rewarding and very refreshing. Having said that, on a practical matter, uh, there is got to be, uh, if we're following the direction of non-interference, some level of understanding uh, with uh, Russia as well, because we all live in the same region. And it's actually in the best interest of every single country, every single neighbor of Belarus, is actually to have Belarus in a better shape with a proper government, with the framework of law being actually used to govern people rather than uh, being used to oppress people. Max Bogretsov joining us there from the Belarusian Coordination Council. Thank you very much indeed.